with this Ross Duncan. Duncan. You can share your screen whenever you're ready. And he's the head of quantum software at Cambridge Quantum Computing, LTD, and the permanent research fellow at the University of, of Strathclyde. He obtained his doctorate from Oxford University, and since then he has held positions as a fellow at the University of Oxford, at the University Libre de Bruxelles, and lecturer in computer science at the University of Strathclyde. His research focuses on the foundations of quantum computing and in particular on the use of category theory and diagrammatic calculi to better understand the structure of quantum states and programs. He's the co-inventor of the ZX calculus and has applied this to reason about quantum circuits, measurement-based quantum computation, and quantum error correcting codes. Since uh, joining the quant Cambridge Quantum Computing in 2018, he has focused on developing the take it, which I think he, presents, he will present it today. Um, which is a software development framework from near-term quantum computers. So uh, thank you very much for participating in QRST seminars and the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Alpha, for the very kind introduction. Uh, thank you everyone for hanging around to listen to my, my talk. So I'm going to talk to you about compilers today, which is my main interest these days. So Cambridge Quantum Computing is my, my main employer. Uh, we're a, sm a smallish um, software company based in the UK and we are looking at um, software for quantum computers considered broadly. So the company is involved in lots of different things and among those things are software for doing quantum chemistry and the this quantum compiler which is what I'm mostly going to talk about today. But before I talk about the compiler I want to just mention the quantum chemistry part. So I know a lot of you are quantum chemists, I am not, so please don't ask me too many questions about this. But the relevant part here is we have a team at CQC who's working on this product called Human which is for doing quantum computational chemistry and it has many many uh, features which which are available there and a lot of what I'm going to talk about today is the fact that it's necessary for the compiler and its application software to know about each other. And I'll come back to that in a little while. Okay, so um, I suppose that all of you are familiar with this term NISC, the noisy intermediate scale quantum devices. And let's look at a particular example. Again, an example which I'm sure is familiar to most people in the room. This is the IBM Melbourne device, um, shown here at a particular moment in time, almost two years ago now. Um, and this illustrates some features of NISC devices that compilers would need to take into account. So we have a relatively small number of qubits. Um, they are connected in a restricted topology. So each of the circles in this diagram is a qubit and each of the edges in the graph is a place where I can apply a two qubit gate. Uh, so not every qubit can talk to every other qubit. You will also see from the coloring of the graph that the error rate is different depending on the, the components. And although it's not shown in this picture, the coherence times of the qubits are also quite different. And you can see the variation in the error rates goes from about 10% um, in the worst case of the C naughts down to a tenth of a percent on the single qubit gate. So it's a very wide variation in performance. Um, and I suppose the last point I should mention about this machine is what you can see in the bottom right corner is that it has this quite restricted set of gates that it can use. And in particular, lots of the gates that people uh, you like to use when they write down their quantum algorithms are not available. On the plus side, um, this is a universal gate set, so we don't have to worry about the issues of gate synthesis, which is a problem when we're in the fault tolerant regime. But of course, the payoff that we have for this is we don't have fault tolerance. We have to deal with errors as like the major problem with using this kind of device. Um, and so since we have only a, a finite kind of coherence time, a lot of the textbook algorithms, for example, phase estimation, this is not really practical for these kinds of machines. Because roughly speaking, the, the circuit depth required is doubling for each um, bit of precision of the output that we want. Um, and not to mention the fact that we're only going to do phase estimation once we have 
prepared the state of interest in the first place, so the cost of preparing that state has to be taken into account. So as Patrick explained very nicely at the beginning of his presentation, what we actually use in these machines is variational algorithms. And so these are the kind of um, algorithms which the, the ticket compiler is designed to handle. So this is the name of it. It's called Ticket. It is language and platform agnostic. It's retargetable and it's designed for NISC devices. So it's available uh, free of charge for non-commercial use and you can get it from PyPy by typing the command shown at the bottom of this slide. Okay, so I think I'm not misjudging by guessing that most of the people in the audience are coming from a physics, C, chemistry, material science background and not so much from computer science. So I'll spend like a couple of slides on compilers. And the idea of a compiler is it's a piece of software that translates a human readable language, which for reasons of irony, I'll call C, into a machine readable language or machine executable language, um, which is some binary instruction set defined by the hardware. So in the old days, it looks like this. Source language goes into the compiler, which is called CC, and out comes the machine code for execution. Now, if you would open up that box, you might find lots of different phases inside this compiler. And the important thing to realize for our purposes is that these can be split up into like three broad groups. The first group at the front end of the compiler are dependent on the language which we're writing our programs in. Um, and the back end are dependent on the machine which will eventually execute the program. However, the stuff in the middle is not really dependent on either of these phases. And so you might think of this intermediate form as encoding the logical structure of the program or the, the flow of data through the program. And in this intermediate language, we can do a lot of transformations, to try and improve our programs, regardless of where they came from or where they'll end up. And the fact that these three phases can be decoupled from each other is the basis of what modern compilers look like, where you can effectively build one central unit, which works with this intermediate representation, and then add modules for the front end to add new programming languages, or at the back end to support new machines and get this modern compiler. Okay, so this is the idea that we used for Ticket. And so there is a large number of, of languages which are supported at the front end, and we can generate um, what we call kernels or maybe simply circuits for execution at the back end. More concretely, the software consists of a C++ library, which is quite highly optimized, uh, which is wrapped up in Python to make it easy to use. And if you try to download it, you'll find that it consists of this core module called PyTicket. And there are a variety of optional modules to interface with the hardware or software of your choice. For example, the PyTicket Qiskit module gives you the ability to write your, so your original program in Qiskit and also to run it on IBM hardware. Uh, similarly, you might want to use the circ module to write your program using Google circ language, but then combine it with the Honeywell module to run it on the ion trap system provided by Honeywell. So that's what we mean by um, retargetable, in the sense there's many hardware platforms available, and language and platform agnostic, meaning you can write your original program in whatever language you choose. And there's a few more things which are not on this slide. We just did a release um, two weeks ago, so there's quite a lot of extra uh, features which are not covered here. Okay, so the basic idea of this, this system is you use whatever tool you want to write your program, and then the compiler will handle the business of running that program on whichever device you prefer. So it's a very powerful and computationally efficient optimizing circuit compiler. So the circuits which come out are as small as possible and it has the best overall circuit uh, layout engine for fitting the circuit onto the hardware constraints of the device which you might want to execute on. The 
internal representation supports symbolic circuits, which is very useful for variational um, algorithms because you don't know in advance what the values of all your parameters are. And these can be optimized just as easily as the, um, the versions without symbols. And by optimization in this slide, I mean making the circuits smaller, not uh, the kind of optimization that Patrick was talking about. And a very important feature here is that most devices today can report their error rates, as we saw on the, the example of IBM Melbourne a few slides ago. And we can, um, we can use this information to ensure that we, the compiler, will place the circuit on the device in a way which will minimize the influence of um, component error. And I think it's this, the, the presentation of Patrick a few minutes ago was, was in a sense quite motivational for this one because if we actually want to overcome the, the obstacles of noise which current devices have, the absolute most important thing we can do is to reduce the amount of circuit which we're actually going to execute. And having an efficient and effective compiler is, is that. So I'll just show a couple of charts. This is showing the performance, relative performance of uh, Ticket, Quill and Qiskit on a set of circuits which are IQP circuits. So uh, if I recall correctly, uh, Qiskit is red, Quill is purple and Ticket is green. Uh, and we can see that when we fit these IQP circuits onto the Melbourne device, uh, the, the methods used in, in Ticket are performing rather better than their competitors. Um, this is our default method. Uh, and this particular set of benchmarks is a bunch of Quawa um, ansatz. And again, we are managing to reduce the circuit depth, or rather to not increase the circuit depth um, as better than the rest. Uh, if we come to some slightly more realistic circuits, and we, this is a benchmark set we call DEEP, but basically they're synthetic versions of the UCC SD ansatz. Um, the green uh, line of the ticket is performing worse than the others. And this, this is the reason why we have good conversations with our friends in the chemistry department. And so the brown line is a specific optimization method, which is developed for this kind of um, ansatz. Okay. So here's an example of how this might work in practice. A very short Python program. At the top, you can see that we are uh, loading in uh, a circuit from a chasm file. We're modifying the circuit. And then in the middle paragraph, we're selecting a computer we'd like to run it on. And then we're checking whether this circuit can be run on that device, which is a priori not, not necessarily true. And if not, we compile it into a form which is suitable. And in the last paragraph, it's dispatched for execution and we get back the results. So it's quite easy to use. And the key point is, this is the only line where I say which device is going to run the uh, program. And if I were to change that line for something else, perhaps um, a device by IonQ, I could just change that one line and everything else would be the same. So zooming in slightly, the structure is like this. We have some front end and it doesn't really matter what that does, um, but it's going to produce some attempt at a circuit, which is then fed into our circuit optimizer. Now this is configurable, so you can choose which methods you want to use. Uh, and then that's independent of the device. And then we add in information about the device itself in this placement and routing phase to generate a device, uh, sorry, a circuit which should actually run on the desired device. And then we do some cleanup afterwards to remove any redundancy that might be introduced in that phase. And an important point, as I alluded to earlier, is that we know what the algorithm is that's coming from the front end. So we can choose the optimization passes um, which suit that, um, that initial program carefully. And you will see that I've written circuit in scare quotes in a few places here. And it's because we don't necessarily want to start from a circuit and we don't necessarily want to stay in the form of a circuit. So what we might want to do is work from a higher 
um, level representation of the thing we're trying to compile. Uh, and we might want to use some things which are not actually circuits in the middle of this process. For example, we might want to use phase polynomials, or we might want to use terms from the ZX calculus. And these things are all um, available to the user and can be turned on and off to achieve the best optimization. So with that kind of preamble out of the way, let's talk about some things that we might do. So the first um, thing to talk about is ANSAD synthesis. So as we all know, the typical setup of the, the hybrid algorithm is that we have a parameterized ANSAT, which we execute a whole number of times with differing measurements. The measurements get combined into some estimate and then we change the parameters in the ANSATs to try and minimize this quantity E. So in fact, this is what is actually happening in one run on the quantum computer. So the question is, what is the actual ANSATS circuit? So two classes of ANSATS are widely recognized, the physically motivated kind, such as the unitary coupled cluster. Um, and these have nice properties in that they probably converge, um, ignoring the uh, issue of, of noise-induced barren plateaus. Um, they're easier to, to reason about because they encode some information about the circular problem we're trying to solve, but the major disadvantage is that they're deeper, much, much deeper than we would like. On the other hand, we have these hardware efficient ANSATs, which have worse convergence properties, don't include, encode the problem, but are typically very shallow in comparison. So we'd like to try to get the benefits of the physically motivated ANSATs in the low circuit depth of the hardware efficient kind. So we're going to look at one particular form, which is the entry coupled cluster ANSATs. If you're not familiar with it, it's not super important. The key thing to notice is that we're applying this um, unitary operator to an initial trial state, and the operator has this form here. Uh, so it's a, a exponentiated sum of Pauli operators. So the compilation strategy that we use here is to recognize that um, we can reorder this, this sum. And what we do is that we sequence the terms of the sum into sets of Pauli operators which commute, and each um, commuting set can then be simultaneously diagonalized. Now this, um, once they're diagonalized, then they can be synthesized with quite high efficiency using phase polynomials. So I'm not going to go super into detail, or I'm not going to go into any more detail than that on this particular method, um, but I will show you a couple of charts. So the method that we've implemented does not depend on the qubit encoding, but here is uh, two charts of the bravi kitayev encoding. And on the x-axis of these two plots, you'll see the number of um, active spin orbitals in the particular molecular simulations we were looking at. Uh, the naive strategy is basically what open fermion does by default. Uh, the blue uh, line is the strategy that I've just described. And the orange one is a, is a less advanced version of that same strategy we came up with last year. And you can see that it's fairly consistent across the range of sizes that we're gaining about between half and a, an order of magnitude yeah, about half an order of magnitude across the whole range. Um, so the, the chart on the left is just the number of CX gates, and the chart on the right is the depth of the circuit when only the CX gates are taken into account. The reason that we focus on the CX gates is because single qubit gates are so quick and they are much less noisy than the, um, the two qubit gates and CX is a fairly arbitrary choice for a two qubit gate. So this is relatively quick in terms of compilation time. And on average, we, receive, we achieve a depth reduction of about 75%, going up to 90% in the best case. Um, the method is suitable for anything which starts from a trotterized operator. Uh, if you're using PyTicket 0.5 or later, the strategy is called PolySymp. 
So there is an archive number, and part of the reason which I don't want to tell you any more about this is because Alex Cowton gave uh, a very good talk about it at the International Workshop for Quantum Compilation last week, and the YouTube link here will take you to his talk. Okay, so we've come in with, uh, with the ANSATS, we've generated a, a low depth circuit for it, but now it has to actually go to the machine, which brings us to the problem of routing. Um, so what is routing? Very simple example, here's a quantum circuit, it has five qubits. Now if you look at the highlighted qubit, the fourth one down, you can see that this qubit is interacting with all four of the others. And if you recall our um, example device, this uh, Melbourne device, there isn't any qubit here, which has four neighbors. So that circuit can't be run on Melbourne unless we do something about it. So this is called the routing problem. And in general, we have an abstract circuit, which I'll call C, and an architecture, which will be an undirected graph. Now, uh, the, um, the nodes in the architecture correspond to the physical qubits and the edges correspond to places where uh, two qubit interactions can happen. And so the idea of, of routing is we start off with a circuit um, which requires uh, a pair of qubits to interact which are not adjacent. And we solve this problem by inserting swap operations. Now, in some um, hardware, swap is actually a physical operation that you can, you can just do, especially in some kinds of ion traps, you can physically move the ions around. But in superconducting devices in particular, that's not an option. And so a swap has to be synthesized from the gates we actually have. Uh, and in this case, it would be C naughts and Hadamard gates. And since C naughts are rather noisy, the fact that we have to pay three of them to do, um, to do a swap is quite a lot. Um, so we would like to do as few swaps as possible. Um, unfortunately, this is an NP-hard optimization problem. Uh, and actually, it's NP-hard just to do it across two layers of, of two time steps in the circuit. Um, so we try to do it globally across the entire circuit. And there is a lower bound result. So the worst case um, is at least log n depth increase where n is the number of qubits. So in Ticket, we employ a heuristic method based on trying to match the largest possible subgraph uh, of the circuit. And so this routing procedure produces three things, an initial assignment of the uh, logical qubits from your circuit to the physical qubits of the device, uh, a modified version of the circuit, possibly with some swaps inserted, and then a final um, assignment for the physical qubits back to the logical qubits, which has no particular reason to agree with the initial one. Okay, um, so again, if we look at two different architectures, we're comparing here two different IBM devices, the Melbourne. Notice on this particular day, Melbourne had 15 qubits, not 14 as on my previous slide, um, and the newer IBM Singapore device. And uh, we can see that the, the um, graph placement method is generally outperforming uh, Qiskit. This particular set of benchmarks is what's called the Quekel benchmark. So these are circuits which are specifically constructed to have a, to be incompressible in this pilot routing. Um, okay, and so we can see that we get an overall um, increase in depth of 1.5 fairly consistently using Ticket versus a bit more than two with Qiskit. Um, I mentioned that the noise is varying. So if we actually use this, we can improve our performance with respect to fidelity. So the chart here is showing you the number of gates in the circuit for some eight randomly generated eight qubit circuits. And the y-axis is the Jensen-Shannon divergence from the ideal noise-free uh, circuit. So this is again running on IBM Melbourne. And if we use the, the noise information to place the circuit on the architecture in a cleverer way than just doing the usual graph placement, you can see that for the same um, amount of infidelity, we can get roughly double the gate count. Okay, 
So I'm being told that my time is short, so I will just skip over this part. Um, the topic is architecture aware synthesis, and the idea is these two phases that I described earlier shouldn't really happen separately. In fact, you can do much better if you combine them into, into one pass. Um, but I will, I will just pass over that uh, quickly. Um, so what are the plans for the future? Of course, we want to have more hardware for, for tickets. Uh, we want to add uh, measurement-based um, devices to support upcoming optical quantum computers. Sorry, we want to have measurement-based um, quantum computing as a, as a paradigm to support photonic devices. Uh, we're looking at uh, new programming languages. For example, CASM has to disappear as soon as possible because its programming uh, paradigm is ridiculously primitive. Um, we're actually designing a new programming language based on um, dependent types. Um, and on the side of compilation, we're looking at more synthesis from higher level ideas, pushing the architecture awareness up the top level, using more machine learning, and then pushing downwards into pro compiling to the analog level, which is pulse control. And last, but by far from the least, is to mitigate noise better. So we already have spam correction, and noise aware mapping and routing in Ticket, um, but we are adding more techniques here in order to reduce the influence of noise on computation, such as approximation techniques, um, noise tailoring, uh, and zero error extrapolation. So with that, I will stop, and I will just leave you with this command, which you can either take personally or type into your terminal. Thank you. Thank you, Russ. Um, I, have, I think we have time for a couple of quick questions, and afterwards we can continue the discussion. Uh, the first one, very quick one, is do you plan to integrate Silk from 88 Zurich? Um, we are not planning it at the moment. We did look at Silk, and I don't remember now what it offered that was better than other systems at the moment. So if, maybe if the questioner can remind me of, of what's happening with Silk, then I could answer better than that. And the other question is from Matthias. Uh, he actually asked two questions. The first one is optimizing this kind of assignments, orders, placement, timings are a badly bad scaling problem. How close can you get to optimality uh, with these heuristics? Are there quantum algorithms that can actually help here? Right, so I, I, I think um, at the world of NISC machines trying to do very large scale combinatorial optimization for the purpose of running other software on NISC machines is, is not a good candidate for a quantum, quantum algorithm. Um, I mean, in general, one could try to encode this as a Kubo problem and people have done that. Um, but we are, we are fairly confident that our heuristics are good. And there is a recent paper from um, uh, Kong and Tan, who I, are in California somewhere, and they did compare a variety of compilers on this um, Queco benchmark, where the optimal circuit depth is known in advance, and the heuristic methods that we have do fairly well now. We get quite close to the optimal. Okay, and the other question was, in your comparison, ticket scales better on average, but in a compilation, it is not the best sample that you would keep? I don't think I understand the question. I, I just read the question, so maybe, Matthias, you can ask that directly. What do you mean? Matthias? Okay, I, oh, he has no microphone. Okay, I think he's trying to say, uh, maybe he can just tap it in the chat so we can continue discussing that later. So I think that we will close the, this QRST right now and we can continue the discussions but without recording everything. So thank you everyone for, for joining us to this QRST. We are preparing the next one at the end of October and, and we were more than happy to see you there. Uh, we will send all the recordings and uh, and uh, slides and the chat history, which is very interesting because there is a huge 
discussion between Patrick and Gidon and uh, to all of the participants that have registered to Eventbrite and uh, we also share it in our Twitter account. Thank you all for coming. <laughs>